Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that is very disturbing and it's very uncomfortable. This is the first time that I've almost felt afraid to talk about her story because of my own personal reasons and because this case is just so scary. But her killer or killers have yet to be brought to justice and that is not okay especially considering what this poor, beautiful young woman had to suffer through. So, because of that, I decided to put on my big girl pants and spread her case and talk about her story and share as much information as I can. So, with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the horrific murder of Karina Saunders. Karina Brienne Saunders was born on July 17, 1992 to her parents Marjorie Queen and Richard Saunders in Oklahoma City, and she was the oldest of seven siblings, Tristan, Jonathan, Benjamin, Joseph, Sarah, Stephen, Chris, and Jonathan. I realized that I said Jonathan twice, that's just how it was listed in Karina's obituary. She grew up in Mustang, Oklahoma and went to Mustang High School before graduating a year early in 2010. She was described as being intelligent, a talented singer with an outgoing and bubbly, goofy personality. She made friends so easily and was able to make those around her laugh until their stomach hurt. She went on to win her school spelling bee three years in a row. She also won a statewide competition for accounting and math which is honestly so impressive. She was also gifted in her musical talent as well, singing all throughout grade school, then earning a spot in her honors choir at her school. Her goal in life was eventually to become a professional opera singer, but if that didn't pan out, she also had dreams of becoming an accountant. She was just known to have such a bright personality and she made sure to stay out of trouble when she was growing up. After graduating high school in 2010, she moved out of the home that she shared with her parents to go and live on her own. But after doing so, Karina found herself going down a bit of a rough path that no one really expected her to go down. This happens a lot with children who are gifted in high school, who are very high achievers their entire early life. They have such high expectations placed on them and then they have very high expectations for themselves. So it can be really difficult and overwhelming to maintain those high standards that you put on yourself and that others put on you. So this can sometimes make it very difficult to stick on that very straight edge path. So as we get into the story, for those of you who want to judge Karina or even if you're just confused on how this happens, Cut her some slack and understand that very high achievers in high school often go on to kind of go down this path because, again, they're placed in such high expectations and it can be very overwhelming. So Karina started to use marijuana and this led her into using harder and more dangerous drugs. According to Richard, Karina's father, the two were very close and they had a unique kind of friendship. She knew that she could reach out to him anytime that she had an issue or needed help, and he would always be there for her no matter what. He would often reach out to her just to see how she was doing, and he would often try to convince her to change her ways and live a safer lifestyle. But ultimately, he could not convince her. Her addiction got to the point where she ended up having to go to rehab. But after getting out of rehab, she was 19 years old, and her life seemed to be getting right back on track. She didn't have a car or a cell phone at the time, so she she depended on other people to give her rides and she communicated with people through social media and those around her were sort of able to keep track of what she was doing and how she was doing based off of what she posts on social media. At the time, Karina didn't really have anywhere of her own to stay, so for the time being, she stayed with her cousin, 22-year-old Catherine. Her and Catherine were described as being more than just cousins. They honestly felt like they were sisters. They were best friends, and they pretty much did everything together. On September 18th, 2011, after getting out of rehab, Karina decided to surprise her mom with a visit to her. Her mother said that Karina seemed like she was doing really well for herself. The two had attended church together as they always did and her mom said that she was acting like herself again. They had an amazing time together and they had reconnected after being away from each other for so, so long. After this, on the same day, Karina went back to her cousin at Catherine's house where she had been staying for about a week at that point. By September 28th, 2011, 
Karina posted to Facebook saying, what's everybody up to tonight? That same day, Catherine and Karina went to a Taco Bell near Interstate 40 and Rockwell Avenue in Oklahoma City so that Karina could meet up with one of her friends of hers named Kenny. Catherine dropped her off at the Taco Bell and waited for her until she saw Karina get into a 90s model blue or gray Chevrolet blazer with 22 inch rims before driving off with her. This is the last time that anybody in Karina's family had seen or spoken to her. So friends and family had heard of this Kenny guy before, but they really only knew him in passing. He would later come out as being 44 year old Kenny Richards. However, according to an affidavit that would later be filed, friends reported that they believed that Kenny was actually pimping out Karina. The friends said that Kenny had taken a nude video of Karina and was intending to post it on the internet, so he just seemed like not a great person overall and this didn't really seem like much of a friendship more of like a pimp and sex worker kind of relationship according to kenny the day that he picked her up from the taco bell the two just hung out for a little bit before he dropped her off at an apartment complex in the 2500 block of rockwell avenue in bethany oklahoma however after this a week passed without anybody hearing from karina and her family really began to worry there was one person who claimed to have seen karina after the day that kenny had claimed to be with her reportedly on october 6th or 7th this man was named keegan and i don't believe they ever really least his last name so I don't think we even really know who this person is however he said that he lived in an apartment complex called studio 41 apartments on North MacArthur Boulevard in Northwest 41st Street in Bethany he said that he saw Karina and he immediately recognized her because he remembered her from high school he said that he said hello to her and she seemed really excited to see him she ran over to him and gave him a big hug and she stayed there for a little bit and they chatted and caught up for a while according to keegan she told him that she had been living with a handyman who lived and worked at that same apartment complex as well as the man's son and was basically helping him with repairs around the complex as a way to pay him back for rent other than this though she didn't say anything further about this relationship that she had with the handyman if anything else was going on or really anything further. After this, a few days had passed before Keegan saw Karina again. At this second time that they had spoken, Karina admitted to him that she hadn't eaten in a few days. So he offered her something to eat and drink, and then after that they hung out for a little while longer. But at that point, she had also revealed to him that she had been living out of this tiny duffel bag, which held all of her belongings. He sort of noticed her rifling through her bag and he felt bad that all of her belongings were stuffed into this tiny bag. So he decided to give her a larger green duffel bag to hold all of her belongings. And once he gave this to her, she was very, very thankful. After this, Keegan said that he saw her in passing about a day or two later, but then after this, he did not see her again. So after the times that we know that she was alive based on these interactions with Keegan, we also see security video outside of a Newcastle casino about 20 miles south of Bethany on Saturday, October 8th. Security video shows Karina getting into a red four-door Ford pickup truck with a brush guard and lights on the top. In the video, they also saw a dark colored car parked nearby. According to witnesses, the girls who were inside of that car were pleading with Karina not to get into that red truck, but police would later go on to say that they don't know who these girls were or why they didn't want her to get into that truck or why they were so concerned with her safety. To this day, I don't think they ever found out who these girls were. There looked to be multiple men inside of the red truck, but they were only able to obtain a picture of one of them, who is the man who got out of the truck to get out and talk to Karina. This man was just described as having both arms covered in several tattoos. However, no one in this truck has ever been identified. Then the next day on October 9th, 2011, Karina received a very disturbing text message to her phone from an unknown number. The message said, I'm going to bury you next to Karina. Now at this point, no one had really known what happened to her. No one really even realized that she was missing. Yes, they were concerned for her, but this wasn't totally out of the ordinary behavior for her not to get into contact with anybody. They didn't see the security video and they may not have even known that Karina was in danger at this point. But this message absolutely set Catherine off and it really terrified her. So she got a hold of Karina's mother, Margie, and together they went to police with hopes that they could identify who was behind this message as well as to file a missing persons report for Karina. This number would ultimately be linked back to a man named Kyle Savage. Kyle Savage was someone who had been friends with Karina for about two years. 
It turned out that in the days and weeks before this, him and Karina had been chatting back and forth for quite a while via Facebook. It also came out that two people who knew Kyle reached out to Karina to tell her that he was bad news saying that she shouldn't talk to him anymore and that she needs to delete him off of Facebook. But despite this, she did not stop her communication with Kyle. So on September 30th, 2011, Kyle sent a message to Karina saying, call me or Brad, we will be kicking it. So when police went to Kyle to ask him about this message, he said that he had no idea that the person that he messaged was Catherine. He said that he thought Catherine's number belonged to another guy that he knew, a guy that he had issues with, because he believed this guy was having relations with Karina and I guess he was jealous. He said that he was just really upset with this other guy so he sent him these threatening messages. He didn't really have any explanations for this text though, only saying that it was weird timing, that it was weird timing that it happened to be sent when she was missing and that he didn't mean anything by it. He said that he didn't hurt Karina and that he has nothing to do with her disappearance, which to me seems like a bunch of BS. It's one thing if you randomly say something outlandish and lashed out and said something like, I'm going to bury you and then ending it there. But based on what happens in this case, him specifically mentioning Karina in that message is absolutely evidence that he somehow knew that she died. Yet nothing ever was further done about this. After this, Margie went sort of crazy trying to spread news about Karina's disappearance. She took her three-year-old son at the time and Karina's little brother, along with her so that they could hang up flyers wherever they could. They also went around and tried speaking to anybody that they could get a hold of, and that is when they learned that Karina hadn't reached out to any of her friends or acquaintances in the past few weeks, and they noticed that she had not been posting on social media like she always did. They continued to search for her to the best of their abilities, but nothing linked to her was found and it was really difficult to figure out her last whereabouts. However, by October 13th, 2011, a horrifying discovery was made. Police responded to a call reporting a suspicious odor at the 7100 block of Northwest 23rd Boulevard behind a Homeland grocery store in Bethany, Oklahoma. A group of animal rescuers were trying to trap stray cats when they noticed a black Nike bag with a foul odor coming from it. When police arrived, they noticed this black duffel bag with the foul odor coming from it but they also noted a smaller laundry bag next to this bag that also had a foul odor coming from it. When they opened the bag, they found partially decomposed, dismembered body parts that belonged to a human wrapped in plastic wrap and duct tape. The head, neck, and the legs without the feet were found in the smaller laundry bag, while the rest of the body was in the larger duffel bag. I also believe that the forearms, hands, feet, and the left breast were all missing from this body. They believed that this person had been taken and murdered somewhere else, and then obviously placed in this location at a later time. They determined that this person must have been dead for about three to four days before the remains were discovered. They sent these remains to the medical examiner who used dental records to positively identify the body as belonging to 19-year-old Karina Saunders. They had to deliver this news to her family, not only that she was dead, but that she had suffered the highest level of brutality imaginable. It's absolutely sick and disturbing what she had to go through. Obviously, this is the family's absolute worst nightmare, but they still had a very long road ahead of them. Over the course of the following days, people gathered to hold numerous vigils for Karina. She was buried in the Mustang Cemetery, and she had an absolutely beautiful headstone in the shape of a butterfly, which was one of Karina's favorite things in the world. Upon completing her autopsy, obviously her manner of death was ruled as being violent homicide, but I don't think they were able to determine the actual cause of death outside of that. That. I will note that none of her clothes and none of her other personal belongings such as her wallet or ID were found near her body and I don't think they've ever been recovered. However, even though they weren't able to rule an actual cause of death, a few things stood out to me after reading the autopsy report. They found no injury to her brain or intrathoracic or abdominal organs, which says to me that she was not stabbed or shot anywhere in her torso or head region. Her hyoid bone and thyroid cartilage were intact, which indicates that she probably was not strangled. It was stated that there's a tattoo that says Queen Spade on her right upper back, which shows rectangular cut marks, appearing that the person attempted to remove the tattoo. It was also found that her hair was chopped very short, done in a very haphazard way. 
It's assumed that both of these things were done in an attempt to conceal the identity of her body. It's also stated that there's suspicious contusions over her right cheek and the back of her shoulder, which says that maybe she was hit that way. Other people say that maybe she was tortured and that's where these contusions came from. But other than this, obviously, like I said, we don't know her exact cause of death. I will also note that there is tramadol found in her system, but they were unable to quantify the amount due to the state of the body's decomposition. For those of you who don't know, tramadol is an opioid drug used to treat severe pain and it is very highly addictive. So it's unknown how it actually got into her system. We don't know if this was a drug that she was using at the time by her own free will, or if it was forced upon her and given to her to subdue her prior to the murder. So now that Karina's body has been found, police had to figure out who was responsible, obviously. And for Karina, this was a very difficult thing to do, given that she's a very social person. She interacts with a lot of people who may have been involved. Because of the intensity of this investigation, FBI quickly got involved to assist the Bethany Police Department. In total, they ended up interviewing over 80 witnesses all of which were known to hang around Karina or be related to drugs in the same circle as her or just be acquaintances. So let's go over a few of the main suspects and how they are involved in Karina's life. So first I'll mention Kyle Savage. Obviously he seems like quite a suspicious person. However, apparently after hours and hours of intense police interrogation, he was dismissed as simply being a jealous and vindictive person. I don't know how they came to this conclusion. I don't know what was said in the interview or how intensive the interview actually was, but police have ruled him out. Then let's discuss Kenny Richards. For him, we will be going back and forth a bit with the timeline, so just bear with me. He was the last person that she was known to actually be seen with by family and by people who can actually account for her last known whereabouts. He had a violent history and he was accused of pimping out Karina for sex and possibly got her into sex work. When police questioned him, he told police that him and her had been hanging out on the day that she was last seen before dropping her off at that apartment complex that we discussed earlier. So this part of the story never changed. For the time being, for many years, no real evidence was found, so he wasn't really looked into as much as other suspects that we will get into in just a minute. But then later in 2017, police received a tip that he had been hiding clothing that belonged to Karina in a tank buried in his yard. So going off of this tip, police started digging on his property. While they were digging and finding evidence, Kenny spoke to a news outlet via text and said, Karina was a friend of mine. I miss her too. I have nothing more to say. After the dig, police recovered a folding knife as well as a woman's shirt, jacket, and sandals, all within an old septic tank that was buried in his yard. However, after being examined by the OSBI forensic unit, they said that these items did not belong to Karina. So he has not ever been charged with anything in relation to Karina's murder, However, he is currently serving six years in jail for drug trafficking charges. I do believe that during this search, there were also bags of meth found on his property, which is why he got sent to jail for that. So for the time being, I don't think he was ever officially ruled out, but I don't think they were looking into him as much because these were not Karina's belongings. But even though these clothes weren't actually Karina's, I wanna know, who these clothes belonged to and why they were hidden in a septic tank. Just because they didn't necessarily belong to Karina doesn't mean that they don't belong to somebody else that might have been harmed. Clearly, he was hiding these clothes and these items for a reason. This knife and then women's clothes being found all together is very suspicious. So I just hope that they're looking into this and they're trying to find answers for this in case there's a victim out there whose case isn't solved that he might be related to. Another thing that police found when they searched through Kenny's phone was that they did find a photo of Karina. Now, nothing else has been said about this photo. We don't know if it's an incriminating photo, if it's just like a selfie or a normal photo. They haven't really said much else. All we know is that police had never seen that photo before 2017, but still, he has not been charged with anything in relation to Karina. So now going back to the early investigation, so 2011, 2012, police started looking into a house that was known around the area as the Drug House, which was located at the address of 3500 South Harvey Street. So, at the time before Karina went missing, the house was known for people doing and selling drugs. 
In addition to this, it was known for being a place that a lot of sex workers would go. Police, of course, frequented this house for various reasons, one of which was an incident where somebody tried to set fire to this house. It just so happened that this house had been professionally demolished the same day that Karina's body was found, so now it's just an empty lot. But again, this house was professionally demolished. It was probably scheduled and people around the town probably knew when this was gonna be demolished and they probably knew to leave the house. So police believed that maybe she had been harmed at this house and then her body was kept there and then the day that it was demolished, they had to move her body to somewhere else and that is where she was moved to where she would later be found. Police did extensive searches of this lot to see if they could find anything else relating to Karina, but nothing came of those searches. So for the time being, they sort of just had to put this house in the back of their mind. They thought maybe it could have something to do with Karina, maybe it wasn't, but this house will come back into play in just a few minutes. So the next person that police started looking into is named Louise Ruiz. In May of 2012, a woman named Tia said that she was hanging out with her friend Louise Ruiz in a motel in Oklahoma City. She states that the two were hanging out in this motel when Luis went to the bathroom and of course left her alone in the room, so she started going through his phone. She said that when she did so, she noticed a video on his phone and when she clicked on it, she immediately recognized the person in the video as being Karina. She recognized her because she had met Karina several times before. She said that she would have to watch over Karina sometimes while she was doing drugs to like make sure that nothing happened to her, so basically being her drug babysitter. But as Tia was watching this video on Luisa's phone, what she saw was absolutely horrendous. She saw the torture and murder of Karina Saunders in this video. She said that she watched Luis tie her up to a table and beat her and then cut off her left foot and then started to cut off her other foot before the saw broke. She said that she watched as Karina was tortured and killed and was just screaming out for her life. She went to police with this information and admitted that she was a sex worker and that's actually how she knew Louise. After this, she was terrified for her life. She informed police of this drug and human trafficking ring where the men would intimidate and control the women and anybody who would act out of line would be punished and tortured. Police said that during this interview with Tia, she seemed shaken up and terrified. They said that just the way she was talking and describing this video made them truly believe that she witnessed something horrific. She said that this drug and trafficking ring was led by 37-year-old Luis Ruiz and another man named Jimmy Massey, who is 33 years old. They were both involved in drug trafficking, human trafficking, and sometimes murder. After this, another woman named Michelle came forward to police with her story. She told police that she had been kidnapped by Luis and Jimmy on October 11th, and then was taken to 3500 South Harvey Street, or the drug house. She said that she saw Luis beat, tie up, and kill Karina. She said that she witnessed them cutting off her feet, as I described earlier with what Tia said. She said that she was forced to watch this and that she was only able to escape because she jumped through the window. She told police that by forcing her to watch this, this of course was basically a threat to her to show her this is what happens if you act out of line. It's thought that at this time, these men were trying to get Karina and Michelle into human trafficking and that maybe Karina stepped out of line. So by killing her and torturing her right in front of Michelle, this was showing her that this is what happens if you don't listen and comply. As a side note, both of these women who came forward are so very brave for doing so. They witnessed what happened to Karina knowing very well that the same thing could have happened to them. That being said, I've seen both of these women's last names being released publicly and I'm so absolutely disgusted and appalled by that. They are very clearly terrified for their lives and media outlets just going and releasing their first and last names is so irresponsible. Just know that these women were put at such higher risk by putting their names out there. It's not necessary. You can put them under an alias. You can put them under a different name. There's no reason, in my opinion, to release their names when they're coming out with these horrific and terrifying stories. I genuinely don't see the purpose of releasing their names when they're dealing with such dangerous criminals. Even with what happens later in this case that we'll talk about in just a minute, it's still irresponsible to release these names. They're clearly dealing with people that have something to do with Karina's murder or 
trafficking or murdering somebody else. So again, please just be respectful, realize that they put themselves out there, they put themselves in danger. So if you can avoid it, please just don't reveal their names. So about a month or two after this, on July 5th, 2012, 37 year old Luis Ruiz was arrested on theft charges initially, but ultimately was charged with first degree murder. Jimmy Massey was already in jail at the time for drug trafficking, but he too was ultimately charged with first degree murder. According to an affidavit, while Jimmy was serving time for his drug trafficking charges, he allegedly communicated with a fellow inmate that he was responsible for a homicide or involved in a homicide, and then he described cutting off a girl's arms and legs. According to the affidavit, at the time that he had revealed this information to the other inmate, this information had not been made public, so there's no other way he could have known. Then, apparently, Jimmy had handwritten notes that he wrote to another inmate where he described, again, cutting and dismembering a girl. In this note, he also mentions how he wrapped up the body parts in plastic, and other ones in duct tape. Again, this also was information that had not been made public at the time. So the handwriting in these notes was compared to other samples of Jimmy's handwritings, and they were confirmed by a handwriting expert as belonging to Jimmy. So based on the testimony of these two women, it was believed that Jimmy and Louise had killed Karina at the drug house just before it was demolished. Now, after word spread in the surrounding area that these two men were being charged with first degree murder, and then the details of her murder came out, people in Oklahoma City really, really started to panic knowing that human trafficking was so prominent in their area. They even started to be concerned that maybe the Mexican cartel had something to do with all of this, and people were really scared. However, police and people in the area alike realized that these statements that they got from these witnesses weren't necessarily good evidence. They come from people who the courts can see as much less credible, People coming forward with these stories were addicts themselves. They were also involved in various criminal activities. None of this was evidence that could be used in court. Rather, it was hearsay and rumors coming from convicted drug dealers, sex workers, and drug users. That's coming from them, not from me. I personally think that what these women experienced was true, whether they got the names wrong. We will discuss more of this later. I don't think that it makes them less credible, but that is what the courts were saying at this time. Plus, a lot of these confessions seemed almost too gruesome and too out there to seem true. It almost seemed like this was taken straight from a crime show or a movie. I mean, to me, I don't exactly know why they would say this. She was dismembered, she was tortured based on you know, evidence that was found on her body, so I don't know why they passed this off as being you know, too strange to be real, but that's what they said. Police did what they could to find the video in question though. They looked through at different cell phones, they checked through SD cards, and they swept through multiple other devices in hopes that they could find the video showing the murder. This is what they needed to do to officially prove that these men were responsible. However, after months of searching, they were never able to find this video, and to this day, they still haven't been able to find it. Then, to make matters even worse, Tia, the original woman who came forward with the story about this video, changed her statement. She is now saying that she never actually saw the video. She said that she just heard about the video from a friend of hers. This was so very frustrating to police because when she originally made her statement, she sounded terrified. She described so many graphic details and they could just tell by the look on her face and her body language that she was scared and that she was traumatized. So to me, I think she either was intimidated to go back to police and recant her statement or she's just a really good actor. So because of a lack of evidence in this case, the prosecution simply was not able to build a case against Jimmy Massey or Luis Ruiz. So in late February of 2013, the charges against them were dropped and they were both released from prison. The entire time that this was going on, even when he was in jail, Jimmy was trying to clear his name, maintaining his innocence. He admitted that yes, he's a drug dealer. He admits to his charges of drug trafficking. However, he said that he is not involved in the murder or kidnapping of Karina or this other woman. He said that he's never even met Karina and that he didn't even recognize her in a photo lineup that police showed him during the investigation. He said that police only suspected him because of his other drug charges. He did serve 10 years in prison for the drug trafficking charges in relation to trafficking meth. Then after being released, I believe he is now living in Texas with a wife and daughter. 
he said that he's now teaching self-defense classes to women and trying to help others learn from his mistakes and is teaching young adults about the dangers of hard drugs. Luis also maintains his innocence. He later filed a complaint for violation of his civil rights, saying that police manipulated known drug addicts, falsified law enforcement records, and coerced confessions. Luis went on to say that he was actually in jail on the day of Karina's murder, and he said that police knew this but just chose to ignore it. In the end, the city of Bethany settled the lawsuit for $50,000 and then two detectives that were assigned to Karina's case were dropped from the case. I do want to say that the day of her death is an estimate. I don't think they ever found out like the exact day that she was known to have been murdered. So if Luis was only in jail for that one day, I don't think that's enough to say that he's not responsible, but if he was in jail for the entire time period that she was thought to have been murdered or when she was missing, then that obviously shows that he wasn't responsible, but I don't exactly know. So now that the charges against these men were dropped, the investigation basically had to start over. The Bethany Police Department were accused of pretty much just finding evidence to support that Jimmy and Louise were guilty rather than looking into all the evidence and then letting the evidence guide them towards an answer. So the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, or the OSBI, took over the case. One of the men who was taken off of Karina's case was named Jack Jenks, the lead investigator on her case. It was found that there was evidence missing from the police inventory and he was looked at as the most likely offender. He was let go from the department and then later was charged with 11 counts of larceny of a controlled substance, but those charges were ultimately dropped. He would go on to be reinstated into the department before retiring with his pension. Then after Jack Jenks was taken off of the case, Lieutenant Austin Warfield was also being investigated and he was let go from the department before being reinstated later. I don't know a lot about the charges against Austin Warfield, but clearly there were things going on behind the scenes that were sketchy and suspicious and could have made it much more difficult to actually find who was responsible for Karina's murder. This also made me wonder if maybe people in the department were trying to hide the identity or identities of the man or men who killed Karina. That's just a thought of mine. It's not proven or backed up by anything other than obviously the fact that there were clearly sketchy things going on in the investigation. It's just a thought. But of course we know that her case still is not solved, so it definitely can be a contributing factor. So other than that, as far as I've seen, no other suspects were publicly named in this investigation. They are still looking into Kenny Richards and everybody else mentioned, but I don't think any new names have come up. By 2016, the OSBI came out with a $10,000 reward for any information identifying Karina's killer. In September of 2018, an anonymous donor said that they would offer $50,000 to someone if they were able to come forward with the video of Karina's murder. They said that if someone isn't able to come forward with the actual video, but were able to identify the perpetrator, they would still offer a payout of $30,000. They basically just said that they were sick of this case going unsolved. They said that if no one steps forward with this video or information in a month, the money instead will be used to hire 10 private investigators. Then they said if nothing came of that, they'd double up and hire a team of 20 PIs. They said, quote, the people that did this should know that their days of being comfortable and their days of thinking that they got away with it and that it's forgotten should end immediately. But still, even with all of these incentives, nobody came forward. I don't know if this team of PIs was made or if they got new information from them. They very could have and just didn't release it, but I really hope that they did. Then in 2020, police came out with a sketch of someone that they believe was seen in the location that Karina was last seen, which is the casino. They said that this person is not a suspect or a person of interest, just somebody that they want to speak with. They said that they believe that this person has information regarding to what happened to Karina that day. So if you happen to recognize who the person is in this sketch, please come forward with that information. I have seen people compare the sketch to Kenny Richards, but I personally believe that if this was supposed to be him, I feel like police would have made that connection by now. I don't know, but I personally don't think that this sketch really looks like Kenny Richard. The man in the sketch looks a lot younger to me, the hair looks completely different, the facial hair is different, the nose, everything looks different to me. The only similar feature that I see is the eyes, but 
I don't know. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you think these two look similar. But unfortunately, other than this, that is all the information that I have on this case. It's absolutely terrifying knowing that the killer or killers of Karina are still out there and are still walking free. I personally don't know who I think could be responsible. I think Kenny definitely knows more than what he's saying, but I don't know if he's involved or to what extent he's involved. Clearly, he's a very bad person. He is not a good person. And the fact that he said that Karina was a friend of his is just disturbing. Clearly, they didn't have like a very equal relationship and you know, that's a whole nother issue, but Kenny is not a good person, but I don't know if I think he's responsible. I don't know if I think Luis is involved because again, his lawsuit was settled and knowing that, I do believe that maybe he had an alibi for the time that this murder was committed. Obviously, again, if he was in jail at the time, that means that he probably wasn't responsible unless they have the date mixed up or like I said earlier, if they just don't know the exact date that she was murdered and if he was only in jail for one day and so many other things that go into that. Maybe the lawsuit being settled has a deeper meaning that they didn't want information coming out about this case so they just settled the lawsuit and decided to move on. I don't really know. I don't know what to make of the lawsuit being settled. Like I said, it could point to his innocence but it could point to them just not wanting certain information to get out. I don't know if I think Jimmy Massey is responsible. I think it's damning that he apparently told inmates that he was involved in this murder. I think it's damning that he wrote these notes. But at the same time, I feel like certain criminals maybe just want a certain reputation when they're in jail. Maybe he was making up the story. Maybe he had heard about who did this to Karina through, you know, a third party and he just took responsibility for it to scare the other inmates. I think that's totally possible, but I do think that Jimmy and Louise both know more than what they're saying. I think that if they're not responsible, I feel like they know who is because again, the fact that Jimmy knew information that had not been released is very concerning. So clearly he got that information from somewhere. So. I wish he came forward with who that person was. I wish he would have talked more, but obviously when we're talking about the world of drugs and trafficking, no one wants to say anything. Nobody wants to come forward. Nobody wants to rat someone else out for fear of their own life. Again, I don't know who I think could be responsible. I think it's probably someone that we haven't even named yet that isn't known publicly at least, and maybe not even to police but I don't wanna rule anybody out and I'm sure neither do police. As for these witness testimonies, I don't know what to think of them either. I personally feel that what these two women witnessed was horrific. I think they very well may have witnessed her murder in one way or another. I don't know why anybody would wanna put themselves in such a risky situation to come forward with this information knowing that they could be risking their lives. Even if it's a lie, even if it's not true, what would their motivation be for coming out with this information? Now, do I believe that they identified the men who are responsible accurately? I don't know. They could be mistaken for someone else. They could be throwing names out there to kind of get police off of the trail of whoever is really responsible. I think that's totally possible. I think maybe these women came forward with these stories if they were coerced by somebody else and maybe somebody else was pulling the strings and saying, hey, you know, you need to get these two lower level guys in jail so that we can continue doing what we're doing and not get caught. I think that's totally possible. But at the end of the day, I think these women are telling the truth and at least about seeing Karina's murder or knowing what happened. Either way, this case is just so terrifying. What this poor girl went through for absolutely no reason is unimaginable. And I can't even begin to understand what her family must be going through. There is absolutely no reason for why she was murdered. Obviously, it's probably connected to drugs, but we don't know how. Did she threaten to turn somebody in? Did she owe somebody money that she couldn't pay back? Did she get kidnapped and put into trafficking and then escape? Or did she try escaping and they just wanted to prevent her to? I don't really know. Obviously, I think it's very important to find out who this maintenance worker that she was staying with is. I don't know if police have ever found out who this person is or if he was looked into or if they were just doing this all behind the scenes, but I'm sure it's a massive clue. It has to have something to do with all of this. Then, obviously, we need to identify the man with tattoos and the other men that she was seen with leaving in this truck. Again, that is a huge clue that we just 
need to figure out at this point. I really hope that people are still putting every ounce of effort that they have into this case. She deserves justice and her family deserves to see her killer or killers behind bars. My heart breaks for Karina's family again. They were clearly all so close. She was on such an amazing path when she was growing up. Her parents clearly cared so much about her and she just got involved in the wrong people and she got caught up with very dangerous things that clearly she couldn't handle and that she shouldn't have been in. Every case has a lesson and I feel like this one is pretty obvious. Just be very careful who you surround yourself with. Be very careful what you involve yourself with. Be very very careful. Don't be too trusting and don't assume that anybody is looking out for you. If you found yourself involved in something like this and you feel that it's impossible to get out, maybe you don't have a family like Karina's, maybe you do, maybe you feel like you have no other resources, there's always a way out. There's always someone who's willing to help. I'm going to do my best to try and do research to find resources that I can link in the description box to help people out. And if anybody is going through something like this, I wanna be able to help. I don't just wanna tell these stories. I don't just wanna spread information. I wanna help people who are involved in these situations. So again, I'm gonna do my research and figure out different resources that you guys can use if you find yourself in this situation or if you know somebody who's in this situation. What I think is really cool is that Karina's sister Sarah is actually studying at the Metro Tech's Basic Police Officers Academy to eventually become a detective and she is working on making others aware of the dangers of human trafficking. She said, quote, if I can prevent someone else from feeling the way that I felt for 10 years, I will do anything that I can, which I think is just amazing. If Sarah happens to see this video, I think you are an amazing person. I think your family is amazing and everything that they've done to try and help Karina and try to bring her killers to justice. I think it's amazing to use this horrific tragedy and make something good out of it. Sarah believes that her sister Karina was killed because she found herself involved in a sex trafficking ring. She thinks that she is escaped or resisted and then was killed to send a message to the other girls to show them that this is what happens when you don't comply. Now Karina's mother runs a Facebook page called Justice for Karina which will be linked down below. Her family is still so very dedicated to finding her killer or killers and bringing them to justice. If you have any information regarding the identity of Karina's killers, please contact the OSBI tip line at 1-800-522-8017. No information is too small or insignificant. It could be the missing piece that the investigation desperately needs, so please, if you know absolutely anything, please contact that number and help bring Karina's family peace and the justice that they so greatly deserve. You can also email the OSBI at tips at osbi.ok.gov. Everything, of course, will be listed down below. So that is all I have for today's video, and now I want to hear your guys' thoughts. Do you think that someone I mentioned in this video is responsible or knows more than what they want to say? Do you think somebody else completely different that we don't know about is responsible? What do you think about these witnesses who came forward? Do you think that they're telling the truth? Let's discuss all of this in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss any of my future videos. Make sure to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram, both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe and stay healthy. And I hope to see you next time. Bye.